I think we'll make a start. So you are now very familiar with this phase diagram, which is an isothermal section of the iron manganese carbon phase diagram. And the important thing to emphasize here is that at a constant temperature, we can have many different combinations of ferrite and austenite, which are in equilibrium with each other. Okay? So obviously, if I have an alloy of this composition, then under equilibrium, this would be the composition of the ferrite, and this would be the composition of the austenite. But what I hope to show you is that during growth, okay, even if my alloy composition lies here, I can pick any of these tie lines to control the composition at the interface. Okay? Eventually, those tie lines will change as growth happens to pass through the alloy of interest. But at the beginning, it can pick any of those tie lines to ensure that the manganese can diffuse together with the carbon and maintain local equilibrium. Okay? So that's the key, that we have freedom now to pick any tie line in that phase field to satisfy the diffusion equations. Okay? Uh, and the diffusion equations that we need to satisfy in order to maintain local equilibrium at the interface, uh, I pointed out to you previously, uh, is that you know, we have one equation for one solute, and its diffusion is dependent not only on the gradient of itself, but also of other elements, okay? and there are cross diffusion coefficients. So you can imagine that uh, the analysis is really quite complicated. For the purposes of simplification, I'm going to say that this is very small. Okay? This is just for the purposes of simplification. Uh, so for multi-component diffusion, we will treat this using just this, this part of the two equations. But we need to solve those equations simultaneously while maintaining local equilibrium at the interface. Okay? So stop me if you have uh, something you don't follow. Okay, so if I go back to these equations, there, there is a problem. Okay? Um, supposing one is carbon right, and two is manganese. I explained to you in a previous lecture that this is eight orders of magnitude larger than D22, right? Because manganese is a substitutional atom and carbon is an interstitial and interstitials can move very, very rapidly. So this is eight orders of magnitude typically greater than this. Okay. The concentration terms in the phase diagram for manganese and carbon are different, but not eight orders of magnitude different. You know, the concentrations of carbon, which are in equilibrium in the phase diagram, are not eight orders of magnitude different for carbon and manganese. And similarly, the gradients are not that different. So we have a problem in simultaneously satisfying both of those equations, that the mobility of carbon is so high that how is it possible for manganese and carbon to keep pace, that means to run together. How is it possible? Okay. So I'm going to show you how this is possible because we have this extra degree of freedom that there are many tie lines which we can choose. So what we can do is we can choose a tie line which reduces the gradient of carbon. Okay. Uh, if you reduce the gradient of carbon, then the flux of carbon will reduce and therefore the manganese and the carbon can run together. Alternatively, second thing is you could dramatically increase the gradient of manganese. That would increase the flux of manganese and allow it to keep pace with carbon. Right? So how can we do this? How can we increase and reduce the gradients? Well, the typical concentration profile looks like this. Okay, where this is C bar, this is C gamma alpha, and this is C alpha gamma, right? Typic, typical profile looks like that. Supposing that I want to make this gradient flat, 
okay? because the carbon is diffusing very fast, so to reduce its flux, I want to make this flat. Then it would look something like this. So there's a very small gradient here, C bar, C gamma alpha, C alpha gamma. Okay? In other words, we choose a tie line which will allow C gamma alpha and C bar to be approximately the same. Okay? So, allow C gamma alpha to approximately equal to C bar for this case. Yeah? That would reduce the gradient of carbon. And the alternative scenario that I pointed out is that you make the gradient of manganese extremely steep. Right? In other words, this would be something like this. How can I make it steep? What is the area under that triangle controlled by? Yeah? Um, the area under the triangle. Remember we had a mass balance equation? It's the total amount of solute that is thrown out, right? Yeah. So if we reduce the amount of solute that's thrown out, that gradient will become steep. How can I reduce the amount of solute that's thrown out? If C alpha gamma is approximately equal to C bar, then the area under that triangle decreases. So the second possibility... Ah, sorry. So this is C bar, this is C gamma alpha, and this is C alpha gamma. So we allow C alpha gamma to be approximately the same as C bar. And then the gradient will be very sharp. So I'm going to go this, through this in detail, but you can see how we can satisfy these two equations simultaneously, given that the diffusion coefficient of carbon is eight orders of magnitude greater than that of manganese. So if I make either the gradient of carbon flat, okay, or make the gradient of manganese extremely steep, so that the ferrite is growing with the same manganese concentration as the alloy, then the two fluxes can keep pace with the same interface. There's only one interface moving. Is so everyone happy with the basic concept? Okay, just, uh, just to repeat for you, because you came late, all right? Uh, these are the two equations that we need to satisfy, because we have got two different solutes, all right? Uh, and I pointed out to you in the last lecture that the flux of carbon doesn't just depend on the gradient of carbon, but also on the gradient of manganese, right? Now, I'm going to ignore these terms for this lecture and treat multi-component diffusion just with this part of the two equations. But the problem is that the diffusion coefficient of carbon is much bigger than the diffusion coefficient of manganese, something like eight orders of magnitude typically. And we have two of these equations, you know, one for carbon, one for manganese, and there's only one interface moving. So, given that the diffusion coefficients are so different, how can manganese and carbon run at the same time with the interface and maintain local equilibrium? That means equilibrium compositions are determined by a tie line of the phase diagram. Okay? So, I'm proposing two possibilities. One is that to compensate for the large diffusion coefficient, we choose a tie line because this is a ternary system, so we have a choice of tie lines. Unlike the binary system, we have many tie lines we can choose from and still maintain local equilibrium because these are in equilibrium with each other, these are in equilibrium with each other, and so on. Yeah? Okay, so in order to compensate for the large diffusion coefficient, we reduce the gradient of carbon. In other words, we choose a tie line which will allow C gamma alpha to be about the same as C bar. 
And the second possibility is we do something to increase the gradient of manganese and that means we partition very little manganese and that makes the gradient extremely steep. So we choose a tylan, which means that the ferrite composition is about the same as that of the alloy with respect to manganese. Okay? So I'm going to go through that construction now. You mean these two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, I'm just using an approximation for the purposes of the lecture. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, strictly speaking, you have to take account of everything. But to explain to you the concept is more important than going into the details of the calculation. Yeah, if you understand the concept, you can deal with the details. Yeah, okay. Yep. And the other one is uh, C bar close to ferrite equilibrium. Yeah, so correct. Correct. Okay. So I'm going to go through the two cases now. Okay, so imagine that we have an alloy of this composition, and this is our ferrite plus austenite phase field, just like I showed you in the um, phase diagram. And this is my alloy, right? Everything is written in your notes. So you can just focus and pay attention. Yeah, forget about taking notes. It's all described in your notes. Uh, and of course, the tie lines are everywhere in that two-phase field. So we don't need to worry where they come from. They've come from you know thermodynamic measurements and so forth. Right. So if this alloy is close to the gamma phase field, that means we are creating the ferrite at a small driving force. Yeah, there's not much supersaturation, and that's why I write this as low supersaturation. If, if my alloy is close to the ferrite phase field, it really wants to transform quickly into a lot of ferrite, right? So that would be high supersaturation. Now, if I want to transform this alloy at a low supersaturation, and I want to choose a tie line that will reduce the gradient of carbon, okay? And we go back to this graph. I want this carbon gradient to be flat. In other words, I want the carbon concentration in the austenite to be similar to the carbon concentration of the alloy. And remember, carbon is being plotted on the horizontal axis. So if I draw a vertical line through here, all the points on that line have the same carbon concentration, right? Okay, so I have drawn the vertical line. Where it intersects this phase boundary defines the tie line, giving me the interface compositions. Okay? So we have selected this tie line, which will flatten the gradient of carbon, compensate for its large diffusion coefficient, and it, I, I can now plot the concentration profiles of manganese and of carbon. Okay, so you can see that the profile of carbon is flat, compensating for its large diffusion coefficient, but manganese must diffuse because the composition of the ferrite is quite different from C bar. So there's long range diffusion of manganese. So this is what we call partitioning local equilibrium. That means the manganese has to partition, but we have local equilibrium because the composition at the interface is defined by the phase diagram. So in this way, the ferrite, uh, the ferrite can grow and the flux of manganese can keep up with the flux of carbon. The flux of carbon is dramatically reduced and therefore the single interface is moving and the fluxes are keeping pace and we've got equilibrium at the interface. Everyone happy with that? So this is called partitioning local equilibrium because manganese has to be taken from the ferrite into the austenite. Yeah? You can see that the composition of manganese, which is on the vertical scale, the ferrite has much lower manganese than far away, 
and the austenite has much higher manganese. So manganese from the ferrite is being pushed into the austenite. So this will be a slow reaction. Okay? It's a, consistent with the fact that it's a low supersaturation. You know, if the driving force is not large, then the growth rate will be small. Okay? Now let's look at the second case where we increase the gradient of manganese to compensate for the small diffusion coefficient of manganese. Okay? Right, so here we are now transforming alloy at high supersaturation because you can see the red dot is closer to the alpha phase field than the gamma phase field. So we start with a fully austenitic material, we've quenched it into this two phase field and it really wants to transform, there's a large driving force. Okay? So in order to get this scenario, I've got to choose a tie line which will give me the same manganese concentration in the austenite as in the alloy. How can I identify that tie line? We draw a horizontal line because manganese is being plotted here. Okay? And that defines the tie line which gives me the interfacial compositions. And if I plot the manganese concentration profile here, it will be very steep. And carbon, it will be like this, where we are partitioning carbon. Okay. So here, that's the manganese concentration profile. The ferrite has more or less the same composition as the alloy. Uh, we are maintaining local equilibrium because this composition is defined by the tie line. Okay. And in the case of carbon, we have diffusion over a longer distance. So because the composition of the ferrite is almost the same as the austenite with respect to manganese, we call this negligible partitioning. That means very little partitioning. Negligible means you neglect, right? Uh, negligible partitioning, local equilibrium mode of transformation. So in this way, with these two methods, you can maintain local equilibrium. The fluxes of carbon and manganese can keep pace with the movement of the interface. Okay? So, do you have a question? If not, I have a question. So, depends on who asks first. Okay? Do you have a question? I mean, you should be thinking, you know, how does the steel know which mode to choose? Partitioning, local equilibrium, or negligible partitioning? Yeah, the driving force for transformation. But is it, for example, possible, uh, here we drew a horizontal line. What would happen if I drew a vertical line through there and chose a tie line? Hmm? Right, so that's... Uh, that's okay, so I'll, I'll just draw this diagram again carbon and manganese and this is my phase field alpha and gamma and I'm transforming at a high supersaturation so instead of drawing a horizontal line I'll draw a vertical line through this to pick the tie line okay so this is a construction line and there's the tie line that I pick is there anything wrong with that? Mm -mm. There's much, much simpler thing wrong. What would the manganese? Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. So both ferrite and austenite have higher manganese than the alloy. So there's manganese being created. Yeah. If we could do that, you know, we don't have to mine for manganese. Okay. So it's 
thermodynamically impossible to have the opposite mechanism at high supersaturations. Right? And similarly, if I do the other case, is everyone happy that this and this have higher manganese than the alloy? Yeah, manganese is on the vertical axis. That's not possible, right? Okay, so this is manganese, carbon, alpha, gamma. And this time, I'm transforming at a low supersaturation. And instead of drawing a vertical line, I'll draw a horizontal line through here. And I pick the tie line. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah, both the austenite and ferrite have less carbon than the alloy. Okay? Right, so that gives us uh, a way of dividing this two-phase field into two regions where in one region you will get long-range diffusion of manganese, in the other one you won't get much partitioning of manganese. Okay. Right, so if we take our tie lines, the red ones, and we simply draw right-handed triangles and join up the vertices, in this region you will get partitioning of manganese. In this region, you will get negligible partitioning of manganese. Okay? So that two-phase field contains the information, yeah, join up the vertices of all these triangles. Here you will get the mode of transformation, which is like this for carbon and long-range partitioning of manganese, so it will be a slow reaction. Here, the reaction will be fast because we are not partitioning much manganese. Okay? So, um, in all our teaching, my teaching if you like, uh, we are assuming that C bar remains the same far away from the interface. If C bar changes, then the tie line will change. And eventually the final tie line will pass through the alloy. Yeah. So that's called tie line shifting. So that's a very good question. I wasn't going to explain that. but. We are assuming at the moment that we only have a small amount of ferrite forming, so C bar is not influenced. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Oh, because it won't satisfy the diffusion equations. In other words, you know, if you are moving at a rate which is controlled by carbon, it will not be consistent with manganese. If you're moving at a rate controlled by manganese, it won't be consistent with carbon. There's only one interface, yeah? So actually, both solutes are controlling the movement of the interface, and that's logical. Yeah? And this applies to even if you have, uh, you know, 10 different elements, yeah? Uh, of course, um, you don't necessarily have to have equilibrium at the interface, yeah? It may forget about equilibrium. And I'll come, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So, so based on this, we can also fix the plane, isn't it? Uh, the plane which had in, it made any infinite orientations. So for a given, given carbon concentration, for hmm. a given composition, the, the ternary plane has to be fixed based on the tie line. Which plane are you talking about? The, the ternary system. Tangent plane. Yeah, you tangent mean. plane. So, the phase diagram is independent of kinetics. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. So and the whole condition. Hmm. So now the tie line is fixed for a given composition for the equilibrium condition. Right. So for this tie line, there is only one plane possible. Uh, yeah, in. that would be the when it touches the two free energy surfaces and also the alloy composition. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Everyone happy with that? Now, I'm going to mention to you an unsolved problem. Okay? That is for you guys to invent and write a paper. Okay? So, so basically, if the gradient becomes very steep, then the diffusion equations are no longer applicable. Okay? Yeah. So, you know, if this becomes, for example, one atom distance or two atom distances, then the gradient is so steep that the normal diffusion equations cannot apply. All right? Because there's something called a soft interfacial energy. You know, if you've got composition varying sharply, then there is an energy because of that sharp variation. And that will oppose the formation of a steep gradient. Okay? So, there are many, many papers in the literature which talk about kinetics and uh, of ferrite growth. And they will do their calculations even if the gradient is, you know, just one atom distance wide, which doesn't make any sense at all. Right? So, this in, a soft interfacial energy will oppose the formation of an extremely sharp interface. And the theory for this exists in spinodal decomposition, okay, where you get a composition wave. But the composition wave is not infinitely small wavelength, because this interfacial energy opposes the formation of very, very small wavelengths. Okay? So, you get a wave which you know, is the wavelength is determined by the fact that there is a certain interfacial energy there when you form a gradient, and that interfacial energy is a function of how steep the gradient is. So, this is an unsolved problem, and you cannot, I think, in my opinion, uh, make sense of negligible partitioning local equilibrium when that gradient is too sharp. And I cannot tell you how sharp is too sharp, because we don't have the theory implemented, right? So, if you want to make a major discovery, this is what you should do, is to apply spinodal theory to this, okay? Of course, we are not developing a composition wave, but the same so-called gradient energy term, which happens in a spinodal, should apply here as well, okay? So, I'm going to move on. It's slightly different in the sense that I'm introducing a different energy. That means that if you have a composition wave, right, of the same amplitude, say, right, in one case you have a fine wavelength, and in the other case you have a gentle wavelength, this is not favored because a concentration gradient itself has something that we call a soft interface energy. So, it's not a change in crystal structure, but because the chemical composition is different, there will be an interfacial energy. You know, if you, if you take a single crystal on one half of it, you've got 20 manganese, on the other half you've got 8 manganese, there is an interface. It's not because of a change in structure, but because of a change in composition. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, Sharp gradients are opposed by that uh, interfacial energy, which increases as you make the gradient sharper. Okay? Right, so let's imagine what would happen if the thickness of the spike becomes physically meaningless. Yeah? You know, let's say it becomes one atom. Then, uh, so I'm not solving this problem, I haven't solved it. Right? This, yeah. Right, and we flux. Only, uh, hmm. it is eight times different. Eighty so, orders of magnitude different so diffusion so coefficient, yeah, uh, roughly. Hmm. So why should we have this zero uh, manganese diffusion? Why can't we have one is to eighty? That will make even. The same yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying negligible partitioning local equilibrium. That means there is partitioning. Otherwise, you would not get local equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. 
At some point, as we reduce the transformation temperature, or increase the supersaturation, the width of the spike will become physically meaningless, right? And equilibrium will break down because the manganese atoms simply cannot move, right? So carbon can still partition, but manganese may not be able to partition. So we reach another condition, which is called para-equilibrium. We've already done this in the case of Wiedmann-Staden ferrite, where you know, the fact that you have a displacive transformation of the crystal structure means the substitutional atoms don't move, but the carbon atoms move. So we can no longer use the equilibrium phase diagram, but we can calculate a para-equilibrium phase diagram, okay, which looks different from the equilibrium phase diagram. Uh, what would the tie lines look like on this? Horizontal, right? Because the manganese concentration of the ferrite will be almost identical to that of the austenite. Why am I saying almost identical? Of carbon, right? So in this case, there's no diffusion of manganese because uh, the spike has become the concentration profile has become meaningless. Okay? But if the carbon is different in the austenite, then even though there is no diffusion of manganese, you will have a different concentration. So strictly speaking, para-equilibrium means that the ratio of the manganese to iron atoms remains constant, not the concentration. Right? So there will be a slight gradient, but it's so small that we can say that the tie lines are horizontal. So if I draw the tie lines on this para-equilibrium phase diagram, they will all be horizontal. Okay? Now, this phase diagram looks different from this phase diagram here. Yeah? What are the differences? Uh, no, in this case, there is no local equilibrium, yeah, because the manganese is simply not moving. Yeah, but just compare this picture here with this picture. It to a Effectively, it's a binary system. So, what difference do you spot, which explains that? No, no, no. Just, just converges to a point here. So, at zero carbon. If the manganese is not diffusing, then it's like a single element. You know, when you heat pure iron, it transforms to gamma at a constant, uh, at a single temperature, right? Similarly here, if there's no carbon at all, and the manganese, uh, and the manganese doesn't diffuse, then ferrite and austenite must have the same composition. Yeah? And that's why this diagram converges to a point. Okay? If I draw the para-equilibrium diagram inside the equilibrium diagram. It will look like this, okay? So this is the para-equilibrium. Why do the lines meet on the horizontal axis? Sorry? Why? Uh, no, on the whole of the diagram, manganese is not diffusing for para-equilibrium. But why do the two diagrams meet on the horizontal axis? So I think manganese is carbon and same. Give me a clear answer. Why do these two diagrams meet on the horizontal axis? There's no manganese, right? So it's just iron carbon. So therefore, they are exactly identical. Okay? And notice that the tie lines, where did I put the, yeah. The para-equilibrium tie line is like this. And the equilibrium tie line, let's say for this composition, is this. Okay? So, Equilibrium says you shouldn't have this manganese concentration in the ferrite. 
but you are forcing the ferrite to accept that manganese because it's not able to diffuse. So you can say that the manganese is being trapped by the ferrite because the interface is moving faster than the manganese atoms can move. And that's the meaning of solute trapping. Okay? Trapping means that the chemical potential of manganese increases when it goes into the ferrite. Chemical potential of manganese increases on entering ferrite. It doesn't want to be there. Yeah? Uh, Paraequilibrium excludes equilibrium. In other words, there simply isn't enough mobility to maintain local equilibrium. Yeah? So, uh, under given condition, hmm. so, uh, what makes the alloy to reach equilibrium or uh, Absolutely atomic mobility. If that isn't there, you cannot have equilibrium. Yeah? So, it will only reach paraequilibrium? Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, in this case, there's only carbon diffusing, so there isn't a... Yeah, I mean, what I mean is, uh, can, I, can I ask you that hmm. the soft interfacial energy is what uh, causing the solute trapping? Is the reason for uh, this, this difference? Yeah, it's slightly, slightly different in the sense that uh, if the soft interface prevents the spike from becoming narrower mm -hmm. to a lower temperature, that means the onset of paraequilibrium happens at a lower temperature. Okay? But paraequilibrium, very clear, as soon as you know, the mobility is lost, you get paraequilibrium. And if you go down even further, you get displacive transformations. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so you can see that the manganese is trapped in the ferrite. It doesn't want to be there. Can you give me another example of a solute atom that is trapped by the transformation in steels? Martensite. Carbon doesn't want to be in there, but it grows so rapidly that it's forced to be. So if the diffusion velocity is smaller than the interface velocity, the solute will be trapped. Okay. Right, so here is the same thing drawn again, that you know, the paraequilibrium boundary meets at a point when there's no carbon, and the two phase diagrams are identical when there's no manganese. OK? OK, so uh, I thought that would be a difficult concept, but the way you've been answering questions, you, know, you fully understand everything I've explained. OK? Uh, but there is one more. Uh, two more diffusional transformations that we have to deal with. One is massive ferrite and the other one is perlite. So today I'm going to finish off on massive ferrite because it's very, very simple. So massive ferrite occurs mostly in alloys which don't have carbon. So for example, iron manganese, iron nickel, iron phosphorus and so on. And because the carbon is not there, and because you can get circumstances in, in which manganese need not diffuse, yeah, the ferrite grows extremely rapidly. It's limited only by the transfer of atoms across the interface. And it's a reconstructive transformation. That means that there is no surface relief produced apart from a volume change. There's no composition difference if you look at the bulk of ferrite and the bulk of austenite. Yeah, so you inherit the phosphorus concentration or the manganese concentration and so on. 
So as soon as nucleation starts, you know, they grow so rapidly that they actually consume many austenite grains. A single ferrite nucleus will consume many ferrite grains, which means that the ferrite grain size will be much bigger than the austenite grain size. Yeah, that is not normal. Yeah? So, can you think of why it's called massive? Ferric grains are huge. Yeah? So, massive ferrite grains, okay? Now, it becomes very difficult in such experiments to measure the austenite grain size because you can't quench you know, the reaction is so fast that you only get ferrite. Uh, if, you, if, you, if the grain boundaries go across the austenite grains, then you can't measure the austenite grain size, right? You have no evidence. Uh, so, this is an experiment that you can do, which is very, very easy. Uh, you take a sample, you polish it metallographically flat, okay? Very, very clean, don't touch it with your hands. Uh, you then put it into a, either a high vacuum furnace or you seal it in a quartz tube and do your austenitizing heat treatment. And what happens is that at high temperatures, uh, the system tries to attain equilibrium at the interface junctions. So this is the grain boundary and this is the surface and the surface tensions try to balance. So you develop this kind of a groove, this is called a groove, which is a, a sort of a channel on the surface, which you can see very clearly when you cool the specimen down. Okay, so from this you get a very good estimate, uh, in fact a very good measurement of the austenite grain size because these are very, very clear when you look in the optical microscope. Of course, you might also get some oxidation yeah, which will color the surface. Okay, so take this as a method for measuring the austenite grain size in systems where uh, you know, you lose all information, all other information about the grain size because if a ferric grain crosses all these, it destroys the original evidence for the austenite grains. So here is an iron phosphorus alloy uh, where, you know, there is some oxidation of the grains. That also helps you to etch the austenite grains at high temperature. And there are thermal grooves along here. So this is uh, just very recently done. Okay? You know these guys, right? Hmm. Uh, now, this is an iron phosphorus alloy, so you get massive transformation. Uh, immediately, you nucleate ferric grains that simply grow across many austenite grains. So, why, why it's very fast? Yeah, uh, simply because we don't have the carbon limiting the growth diffusion of carbon limiting the growth. Yeah, more or less zero. You know, it's almost impossible to get rid of all the carbon, but it's more or less zero. That's in the galvanizing, right? Yeah, yeah but uh, there's no transformation there, uh, oh, except liquid to solid, yeah? OK. Maybe, maybe that is the reason, yeah? I, do, I don't know, you see? Okay, okay. Right, now, how can I see the ferric grain structure? So we've got the austenite grain size very clearly defined. Now I want to see the ferric grain size. What can I do? No, no, it's cooled already, yeah? But what we are seeing is the austenite structure. Hmm. Uh, all the evidence we see here is completely the surface of the sample, which is the grooves and the oxide etching. I now want to see exactly where the ferric grain boundaries are on the same specimen. How, what can I do? So I want to retain the evidence for the austenite grains, but I want to see the ferrite grains as well. 
So this is quite a deep groove. Okay. Uh, if I just lightly polish this, then the grooves will stay there and then etch it. Then it will only attack the ferrite grains because this will be a single crystal of ferrite underneath. There's no austenite evidence left except the grooves. Okay? So if I lightly polish and then I lightly etch, and this is what the same specimen looks like. Okay? So these dark regions are the etched ferrite grain boundaries. These are not attacked by the etchant, yeah, because their boundaries don't exist. The ferrite has grown. But the grooves are not eliminated because it's only lightly polished. And you can see all the austenite grains. Okay? Beautiful image. So to summarize, massive ferrite is not difficult. It's a reconstructive transformation. Uh, the ferrite inherits roughly the composition of the austenite, and the grains of ferrite are large. Okay. It's called massive because the ferrite grain size grows much bigger than the austenite. So we are using massive as in the English language. Yeah, very, very big. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture, and we have one more phase transformation to do, which is the perlite. And I will load all the uh, slides onto the EDX system, okay?